Sabin. I'm a professor of strategic studies in the War Studies Department here at King's. Uh, I've been working on air power, among other things, for many, many years, uh, too many years, um, working particularly with uh, the Chief of the Air Staff's Air Power Workshop. We've done a number of volumes uh, of uh, studies, academic and uh, military authors, studying different aspects of air power. Uh, and the one that we did a few years ago, as it happens, was about uh, unmanned air systems and drones. Um, uh, I think it's in that context of air power rather than as a uh, standalone system that these things are best understood. So, to give everyone a fair amount of knowledge about the issue, we asked Dr. Dr. Professor Kaven to give a huge context of your own and the history of it. So, can you get this Okay, yeah, right. right. To pick up from, from where I, uh, I just left off, we tend to think of a weapon system as the platform itself, so in this case, the thing with wings and, uh, and the tail plane. Uh, I think in this case, uh, it's particularly inappropriate to do so, because more and more modern warfare is not about individual soldiers, individual uh, pieces of equipment, it's about a system of systems, it's about a network. The very term drones is actually extremely misleading. Drones is a term that refers to a self-contained system, like, for example, a V1, the Germans would use to attack Britain. You fire it off, and there's no input to it, no emanations from it. It just continues with its own gyros, reaches its range, and falls down. Uh, and it's on a target drone that you set on, you use uh, as target practice for your aircraft or your, uh, or your missiles. That's what drones actually means. To use the term drones for these systems that we're talking about today uh, is, is a misnomer. A much more accurate term is remotely piloted air systems, because that's the only way in which they really differ from conventional aircraft. They don't have a pilot in the aircraft itself, in the airframe, but they do very much have a pilot with a joystick and everything down on the ground, sending radio signals and receiving back from the drone television pictures <coughs> which allow them to see where the drone is and obviously to orient it and to, uh, to see uh, potential targets and so on. So remotely piloted air systems is a much, much bigger mouthful, of course. You can see why uh, the, uh, the media in particular would use the term drone. But remotely piloted air systems gets much more into what these, in fact, are. A lot of the issues that these systems raise are nothing new. They're raised by air power in general. And in fact, the sensitivity that we have to many of the uh, current uh, deadly uses of uh, remotely piloted air systems um, are a good thing because it shows that we're becoming much, much more humane and much more civilized than we were, for example, uh, a generation or two ago, when we were routinely bombing, fire bombing entire cities, uh, and everybody thought they deserved it because they shouldn't have tangled with us in Dresden or in uh, Hiroshima or wherever at the time, I have to say. So it's a good thing, and I'm very pleased that we have this sensitivity. Uh, but as I say, there's nothing specific about unmanned systems, which is entirely new from that perspective. Unmanned air systems are not new in themselves. They've been around almost since air power was around. There were unmanned uh, aircraft used before in World 
or one-handed World War II. What's really changed in terms of technology is the computer and the microcomputer, allowing us to have control systems and information transmission systems back and forth in a much more achievable way than it ever has been in the past. So unlike the drones of the past which didn't have these control inputs, these can now be remotely piloted in real time, literally from thousands of miles away using satellites and so on. So that's what I mean about the system of systems and the importance of the network. The platforms, the airframes themselves, are just part of that human-dominated um, framework. And so the idea that these things are in any way autonomous robots, no they're not, quite the opposite, and I don't think they will be for a long time, if indeed ever. What the innovation of allowing the pilot to be put somewhere other than in the airframe allows is a great deal of pushing of the envelope of technology beyond what the human constraint would otherwise entail. And that's in a couple of ways particularly. One is that the range of sizes of these systems can be much more varied. If something has to carry a person, then that has to be of a certain size, of course. If, on the other hand, you remove that limitation, you can have tactical unmanned systems, which are really tiny. And some of you may have seen the army doing a recruitment commercial around this for some years, uh, where the army uh, would uh, have a chap who was letting go a model aircraft, and up it would go, and he was controlling it with a little joystick, and that's got a camera on it, and that was helping give a tactical picture of what's around the patrol. They're now getting even smaller than that, and the press reports about uh, ones that are the size of, uh, of my hand or less, because of the miniaturization with microchips and components and so on. So you can have one up to the size of, of ordinary light aircraft, but down to that size. So that's one way in which these unmanned systems have uh, pushed the envelope. The other way uh, is in terms of duration of flight. These things can stay up in the air for a lot longer than uh, a human could endure. So they can stay up for tens of hours. There are even kinds which are now using solar power during the daytime and storing it in batteries that can stay up for months at a time. But in both cases, they're pushing the envelope beyond what humans were able to do. But they're not fundamentally different from ordinary aircraft. Who has them? Again, it's pretty much the same pattern as you get with ordinary aircraft. The USA is utterly dominant here as it is with manned aircraft. Western nations such as Britain operate typically US-made drones in small numbers. Very useful for currency now, uh, a bit to avoid doing such because it's a, a currency. Um, the Israelis have used them for uh, several decades, uh, particularly in terms of uh, tactical uses in 1982, for example, in uh, the, uh, the war in Lebanon. The Chinese are coming up. The Chinese are reverse engineering, actually, a lot of the technology. They've been doing that ever since they captured some American uh, uh, unmanned systems uh, during uh, the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, one reason, I think, why unmanned systems in this network world are less likely to become the weapon of the weak is because they depend on electronic superiority. They only work properly if you've got secure communications from a great satellite network which can't be disrupted by the opponent. The Americans hope that they will be able to retain that, certainly, of course, in the context of wars like those in Afghanistan and Iraq. The Chinese maybe think that they can manage it as well, which may be why they're making such a problem. Most other nations would be pretty stupid to put a lot of effort into unmanned, remotely piloted systems if a clever computer virus or electronic warfare uh, initiative could make them literally fall out of the sky because you would lose control of them. You see. So I think these are not necessarily the weapons of the weak in their present form. Drones might be, like the V1s, ones that you simply send off and uh, they're not dependent on external inputs. But the kind that we're seeing like in operation with the Americans and others currently are very dependent on being the superior side. So they're an asymmetric weapon of the strong rather uh, than the weak in technological terms. What are they used for? The kind of strategies uh, for which drones uh, are, uh, are, are employed used to be called for the three Ds. 
dull, dirty, and dangerous missions. So, manned aircraft are used for most roles, but for things that are dull, dirty, and dangerous, you can use these unmanned systems instead. There's two other Ds been added to that, and that's where most of the controversy now arises. One of those further Ds is D, so at long range. These systems are not fast, but they can stay in the air a long time. You might only fly at 200 miles an hour, but if you're up there for 10 hours, you can go quite a long way in that time. And you can stay there orbiting at some distance from your home base for quite a long time. The 50, of course, is by far the most controversial, and that's deadly. And that's, I'm sure, where we'll be having most of our uh, discussions today. That doesn't change the fact that the primary role of unmanned systems has been, and still is, and will remain, intelligence. Intelligence is by far the most important word. What these systems allow is persistent observation from the air of what's going on on the ground. And you've all seen, I'm sure, the pictures uh, from the cameras on these systems which allow you to look down uh, and see what's going on on a persistent basis rather than from a satellite just flapping overhead and taking uh, a snapshot every, uh, every few hours. So intelligence is key. And intelligence, of course, in the larger sense, is absolutely crucial to even the more deadly use of unmanned systems. Because they're not area weapons which will destroy whole cities, like atomic bombs or cluster munitions which destroy a whole area. They're firing precisely targeted precision weapons, just like manned aircraft drop in conflicts like Libya and uh, Kosovo and so on. Um, and so knowing what is in the target vehicle or the target bunker or the target building is absolutely crucial. If you don't know what's in there, then obviously uh, you don't want to, to, to drop the weapon. Uh, because you might uh, kill civilians uh, and not even uh, hit uh, a, a target uh, for which you're aiming. So intelligence is fundamental and not necessarily intelligence provided simply by observation from the drones themselves, intelligence for espionage and spying and so on. One of the big things that drones change is risk to your own forces. In air power, certainly in the early 20th century, the casualty rate among airmen and among bomber pilots was enormous. They were really taking their life in their hands when they went to uh, try and uh, cause damage uh, in opposing territory. That's become, of course, much less so, and with the growing asymmetry in warfare, you have entire wars like Kosovo, like Libya, in which manned aircraft suffer no losses in terms of pilots. Drones really just take that to the extreme, <coughs> remotely piloted systems take that to the extreme where there's no chance that the pilot themselves will be killed even if the drone is shot down or malfunctions because of course they're in a cabin somewhere in the bar. Now what does that mean? That means, I think, that there is more willingness to use these systems in contents in which you really would not be prepared to take the risk, even a small risk, of a pilot or an air crew member being taken uh, prisoner particularly or shot down and lost. Uh, conflicts such as those in Pakistan or Sudan where there isn't even a declared war uh, are obviously top of, uh, of that list. But there's something interesting, something cultural as well, which flows from that. And it gets at the notion of fairness in war. I think one of the main objections to the use of unmanned air systems is they're not very chivalric. You're not prepared to go and put your own life at risk when you're threatening and, 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 and killing other people on the ground. And that's seen as somehow unfair. We just need to step back a bit because is war fair? Is war chivalric? Just been lecturing from them, I've been to some of you here. Um, about uh, Greek notions uh, <laughs> way back in the classical era, 2,500 years ago, of what was fair or not. And they thought archery was unfair because you weren't prepared to stand next to the enemy and put your own life at risk while you tried to stab him with your spear. So notions of fairness change over time. And this issue of ranged weapons and how far you try to put yourself back out of harm's way is something which runs through the whole history of warfare. Roadside bombs. Improvised explosive devices, minefields, booby traps, of course, are the 
drones of the week, if you like, in that if they're not prepared to put their own lives at risk, and of course many of them are in the case of suicide bombers, but if they're not in a particular case, that's what they will do. Put a bomb there, run away, and then uh, hope that it goes off at the right time when uh, a patrol comes by. So in some way, unmanned systems are just doing the same back to the insurgents uh, and, and trying to reverse uh, the balance of risk. The way that they're used, particularly in the most um, controversial context, which we'll come to shortly, of targeted killing, that is very, very interesting and very, very controversial. And even among the practitioners, even among military specialists, there are big debates, and I'll give you some references <coughs> at the end in a second, uh, as to whether targeted killing, hitting people like bin Laden and his lieutenants and the Al-Qaeda uh, leadership and the Taliban leadership, is that a good thing to do purely in strategic terms? Some people think, yes, this tends to be the dominant American view, and it's good to take away the enemy, to get rid of them, to remove their uh, capability to plan, uh, to get rid of the capable leaders, and then the other ones will be less capable and running scared and uh, dead communicate because otherwise they'll make themselves targets and so on. That's one view. There's another very powerful view which says the opposite, which says actually, if you have this targeted killing, particularly from what's seen as an unfair weapon system, you will make martyrs, you will make as many people hate you as you've just killed, or perhaps more. You will radicalize the opposition, uh, you'll infuriate them. And this is always the problem, of course, in a guerrilla war. It's not difficult to kill the guerrillas. What's difficult is to make sure that by killing the guerrillas, you don't make even more guerrillas than were there in the first place. There's a very live debate about this, and I'm sure we, we can continue uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on those grounds. Very interesting to see how things have changed over time, uh, finally. Um, the height of the drone campaign, particularly in Pakistan, was in 2010. And it looked to some observers as though it was just going to continue and get more and more and more uh, 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 pervasive over time. In fact, the number of attacks by unmanned air systems in uh, Wadiristan has been declining very significantly ever since then. And of course, uh, Obama acknowledged this hitherto covert campaign at the start of 2012. Uh, and earlier this year said it's winding down and John Kerry said it's very, very soon going to end because we've won, because we've taken out all of the Al-Qaeda leadership, we've won the war, that's why we don't need uh, to do any of this anymore. Uh, I think another interpretation of that, of course, is it's become so politically controversial, particularly in Pakistan, and this issue of possible counterproductivity has become so live that maybe it's a case of uh, let's declare a victory and withdraw, which is always the, the way in which uh, you get out of a, 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 a nasty entanglement and that's what we're doing in Afghanistan uh, as a whole. So, lots of um, uh, issues there. I said I'd finish with uh, some suggestions as to reading, perhaps in a surprising sort. Um, this is not a debate in the sense that I'm not advocating the use of unmanned systems, saying that target killing is wonderful and so on, as you will have gathered. Um, you might be surprised at how equivocal the, 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 the reactions of official sources are, including actually the official UK position. Online you'll be able to find uh, the Royal Air Force Air Power Review, which you might think is a very conservative, uh, pro-air power, pro-bombing source. Uh, in the last few years, um, this has, been, has, has uh, a number of articles from both sides of the debate uh, that I just outlined. The other thing you could look at, and again just Google it online, Joint Doctrine Note 2 slash 11. Joint Doctrine Note 2 slash 11 by the uh, Development Concepts and Doctrine Center uh, here in the, the UK. It's by um, Clive Blount, an RAF officer. And again, he is very, very open to multiple interpretations of these things, talking about the ethics, talking about the legality. So this is by no means one in which you have the military taking one view and non-governmental organizations and so on <coughs> taking the other. There is a live debate here. It's an issue on which reasonable people may differ. Uh, I look forward to uh, continuing the discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Steven. Uh, we'll now move on to the Friday's and we will give a more normative and real life approach to the issue here. Uh, so, of course, in the event of terror attacks in Pakistan and possibly in Arabia. So, fair enough. And if you have any other questions you would like to ask Professor Steven, we'll have a QA session at the end. So, we'll move on to that. I'm going to reverse the camera Professor Steven was talking about. Yeah, if you see what it looked like on the ground, on the ground. 
I'm going to tell you what it looks like from the people on the ground who have to bear the one look at. For people in North Revere and Sand right now, an area the size of Wales, there are two, three, four drones overhead, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They, the noise is so persistent that they've given it a name. They call it Zangana, buzzing loss. They can't sleep at night. There's been total social disruption. Neighbors don't trust neighbors. People are afraid to go to the market. Why are they afraid to go to the market? Because in the past, since 2009, since Obama came into power, there have been 350 drone strikes in an area the size of Wales. Nobody tells the communities who they're hitting. Nobody tells them who's being targeted. And nobody tells them why they might be killed. And in fact, the US hasn't just been targeting high value targets. <coughs> best guess by an institution that tends to be more conservative on their numbers, maybe only 2% of the more than 3,000 people who have been killed qualify as high value targets. So the vast majority of people who have been killed, we don't know their names. We're looking at 3,000. One U.S. Senator said the total in Yemen and Pakistan was 4,500. He sits on the U.S. Intelligence Committee. Now, who knows where he got his numbers? They don't. The high value targets, the reason the number is so low is because a large percentage of the U.S. strikes have been based on what's called pattern of life analysis. The drones cover there 24 hours a day, they watch the behavior going on on the ground, and they decide when behavior is suspicious to launch a missile. It might be you're driving towards the border, it might be your group of men gathered together, it might be that you've got weapons on you. This is an area that has been highly weaponized for decades. Everyone has a weapon. Uh, it is part of life in the tribal areas. When you're taking strikes based on pattern of behavior, of course you don't know who it is. And the result on the ground is they don't know what they're going to, what's going to get them killed either. Going to the market might get you killed, either because you stood next to the wrong person or because you did something that looked suspicious. Gathering in groups might get you killed. There was a very, what's now become a very famous strike on March 17, 2011, where you had 40 to 50 community leaders who were gathered for what's called the traditional jirga. The jirgas, part of tribal culture, are about settling disputes. The area still is governed under an old colonial law, still uses many tribal traditions for governance. They're not part of the central government the same way that other areas of Pakistan are. The, the dispute that day was over a chromite mine. By all accounts, it was a peaceful jirga. The Pakistani government had been notified the jirga was going to happen. The Pakistani military had been notified the jirga was going to happen. And the U.S. launched four Hellfire missiles at this jirga and killed upwards of 50 people, many of whom were senior leaders in their community, many of whom were caring for others in their community. Since that day, the community has not has, has never again held a jirga. So disputes are going unresolved. Because now the new lesson they learned from that strike is if you gather in more than two or three, you might be killed. By all accounts, it was a signature strike. That's what it looks like from the ground. Constant surveillance from overhead, unknown missiles firing down at you, no idea why or what you can do to make yourself safe. So is a drone like a plane? Yeah, in a lot of ways, everything Professor Sabin said is correct. It is a, an aerial vehicle. Um, the only thing missing is the pilot. The difference is the ability to hover over communities creates a new dynamic you don't have in the deck. It effectively allows you to imprison an entire area, and it changes your risk culture. Do you go to war in North Rivieristan? Probably not. You launch Hellfire missiles with no risk from an unmanned aerial vehicle. We've seen the answer to that. You launch them 350 times. You expand the global battlefield beyond <laughs> Afghanistan and Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, <coughs> Somalia. All three have had drone strikes. All three have drones regularly flying in the US. The U.S. hasn't declared war on any of those countries. So when you're looking at this, at how drones are being used and what unmanned capabilities allow, it does become dangerous. 
at least in the way it's been used, that technology has been used today. I think the other thing that we need to kind of pay attention to is we hear a lot with unmanned technology this term precise. This is the most precise technology we've ever had. That's absolutely right. The missile probably most of the time hits what it is intended to hit. The problem is if your intelligence is bad, it's hitting the wrong thing. And this is where you've got huge problems in terms of whether this is a strategically smart weapon to use. The intelligence that's been used to date probably isn't correct on a large number. And here, how do we know that? Well, there were more than 700 men <coughs> imprisoned in Guantanamo Bay. By the U.S.'s own accounting, more than 85% were cleared of any wrongdoing. <coughs> if you assume we're happy <coughs> with our intelligence and our use of drones, we're still killing a heck of a lot of people where our intelligence is just bad. There was an intelligence week, and, and I'll go on in a minute to, to what I see as kind of two big, bigger issues as well. But there was an intelligence week um, in Plasky, an online news source, by a journalist named Jonathan Landon in April. He, got, he was given access to some CIA documents. And that's another thing we should mention about this. These unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, remotely piloted aircraft, whatever you want to call them, they're not being flown in a lot of places by traditional military. They're being flown by intelligence agencies, who, in an essence, been trained as a paramilitary organization. That is certainly the case in Pakistan. All of the drones being flown, for the most part in Pakistan, are being flown by the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. Back to Jonathan Landy's article. Jonathan Landy's article and the intelligence he was given access to showed that 50% of the time, on average, the CIA had no idea who it was hit. It listed people as unknown militants, militants, fighters, males, no clue who they had killed. There are at least 10 cases in Pakistan high value targets who have been killed multiple times. Not just once, not just twice, but we actually killed them four times. That begs the question, who got killed the first three times? Because the news leaks that came out said they were killed all three of those times too. And the way to buy the line they're fed by the intelligence team, which is the drone strike killed six million, the drone strike killed seven million, Drone strike killed maybe five million. What reprieve investigations are finding is that a lot of the times they weren't militants at all. They were school teachers or neighbors or people who've been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe a neighbor said, Oh, I think they're CIA, they're, they're, they're militants. Maybe they're this. They're certainly not leaders of Al Qaeda. There's certainly not evidence that they're planning attacks on anyone. Um, in Yemen, uh, we, one of our clients is a guy named Faisal, and I hope to be able to show you some pictures and we have to get the PowerPoint. Faisal's brother-in-law was an uh, imam who was actually preaching against Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. He was taking a lot of slack for preaching to the community against AQAD, <coughs> and Two very young 17, 18 year old militants, and we can have a discussion later about what that term even means. And there's a lot of terminology that gets thrown around in this debate. Um, asked to meet him. So the weekend of his, nephew, his nephew's wedding, he took his cousin with him, a young 20 something year old man, to meet these two young militants to see if he could talk them around against what they were doing. The U.S. launched a drug strike and killed them. Overnight, they killed someone who was one of their biggest allies in this community. The kind of people you want in this debate on your side out there preaching against radicalism, against hatred, 
and they also managed single-handedly to turn a significant portion of the community against them. <coughs> because the community's question was, if he can get killed, why not me? Why not anyone? And I think until we start grappling with the names of these people and the extent to which drones have allowed an expansion of the battlefield, that at this point, the way the U.S. is using them is pretty much global. We're looking at a very slippery slope. The technology is not going to remain in U.S. hands. It's not going to remain in the U.K. hands, and it's certainly not going to remain in Israel's hands. At some point, this is going to leak out. Uh, even little drones, these little ones, could theoretically be armed with them. Now, if we don't, and this is where I said I go on to transparency and accountability. If our governments are not transparent about how they're carrying out these acts and accountable for their actions when they, when they take them, then the precedents that are being set are pretty scary. At the moment, because the U.S. refuses to talk about the rules that set in place for this program, one could quite reasonably interpret it that all a country has to do is declare someone a terrorist, and they can launch a missile at them. That goes against everything this country is founded on and everything the U.S. is founded on, which is due process. That you're innocent until proven guilty. That we don't go around just killing people because we deem them to be terrorists. I think the other thing this debate invokes in which we need to grapple with it, which hits home very much here in the UK, is the idea that these drones are out there collecting data, this big data problem um, that feeds very much into these drones. You're, they're taking targets based on things like network analysis, they're having phone calls, they're seeing nodes, and that's what signature strikes are sometimes. Well, that data is is often wrong. And to what degree should government be tracking that intelligence and saving and storing big data? And then to what degree are they sharing it? So we have a UK High Court case right now where GCHQ admitted in the press that they had shared locational intelligence for drone strikes with the US government. That makes them, in our eyes, complicit in a broader problem. Intelligence sharing, just because you didn't pull the trigger on these things, is problematic if you know that intelligence is then going to be used to carry out part of those killings. Um, one last thing I think I'll, I'll end with is um, I think. I think we, with technology, there is a seductiveness about new technology, and I'm not going to lie. Yo Sushi just announced um, two months ago they're going to deliver sushi with drones. It sounds really fun. It sounds fantastically fun. I think there was Domino's was looking at delivering pizzas, and someone else was looking at doing something else with them. Um, the technology could be very useful, but what often happens with technology? is the technology gets ahead of the legal framework. And to the extent that we don't, we either try to alter legal frameworks that are already in place, which on targeted killings, there's very solid international law on when you can kill someone and when you can't kill someone. And the reality is that the war on terror is just causing the U.S. to buy it. But there are, there's also an argument that this technology is shifting rules. You know, should we be able to put a drone over someone's head 24 hours a day and potentially terrorize them? <coughs> Those are debates, ethical, moral, legal, we need to be having. Um, and the implications of it have to do with our own security here. <coughs> <coughs>